We have audio, the TV works, yeah, we can start. Um, for guys who are in the room, uh, have you heard what, do you know anything about functional programming? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's anything, you haven't even heard of the term. You have used it in the previous, you used the word to say that there's different types of programming. Oh, no, no. It is. In, the, it is the, in the object project, uh, object oriented programming, uh, the time that we did. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because uh, what, what happens is there's lots of ways of, to, of designing programs. Um, we normally use procedural. The last one we looked at was object, object oriented programming. That, it tries to mimic the, you know, the way that we actually manufacture or create actual goods and all those things. And then there's functional programming. Now, functional programming is also a style of programming that actually we have used before. If you've used it a lot, if you've used an Excel formula, that's functional programming. The thing they call DEX, that's functional programming. <laughs> so, so what, what, what functional programming does is. First of all, it tries to make everything put. It tries to put everything on a single line, like everything on a single line. You can't go do that. And the next line, do this. No, if everything you put, like even on Excel, you have one cell where you have to put in the entire formula inside of it. So what, what happens is it favors. Okay, now in terms of Python, uh, okay, I think in, like in general, it favors what is called fun, uh, functions without any side effects. So. A function with a side effect is basically this. That when you know when you're writing a function, the only thing most of the time you want is the output at the end, as in the return statement, right? But if your function does something else before it gets there, that's a that's a side effect. Like a, the print function is mostly a side effect. So if your function prints out a lot of things and then returns something at the end, all of those print uh, st uh, statements are all side effects. So with functional programming, you don't do that. In functional programming, you are only worried about what the function is going to take at the end, uh, nothing in between. Another thing is immutability is king. So which means everything gets created once. You don't come, you don't create a list and then come back and change the list or modify the list. If you want to change the list, you basically have to create a new list from taking the old list and then adding something to it. Uh, so immutability is very, very important. Uh, another thing that's important is it's, it uses built-in functions or it focuses a lot on using built-in functions more than the ones that you are going to try and customize. So if there's something that can do the job inside Python or inside whatever programming language that you're using, use that instead of trying to make your own thing. Um, like for instance, if you're looking for maybe the, the maximum value in, in a list or in a, or in a set, don't now go write your own little thing to try and figure it out and look through everything. No, there is a function called max inside Python. So you always go for the built-ins more than it, everything else. And another reason for using built-ins is that uh, built-ins are actually more optimized. Than, what, than the actual code that you're going to be writing most of the time. Because you might find that the built-in function, even though it's Python, but you might find that underneath, it's actually running some code. So your one will be just Python, but the actual built-in is not just Python. It's actually maybe C or C++, C, uh, C or C++ code running on its own, but it's, it actually ends up uh, being way more efficient. Plus it's tested way more than your one. <laughs> so, it has that. Uh, another thing is, here yeah, I just put more expressions in this statement. So it focuses heavily on expressions. So what an expression is, uh, the, the, the easiest way of remembering it is everything that evaluates to a value. Right? So basically, uh, one way to check is can you put it into, inside a print statement? Right? That's, a print, that's an expression. So what, what is a statement? A statement, well, you can't put, you can't put a function definition inside a statement. You can't so all print def my function arguments, it won't print out. Yeah. But you can put the output of a function inside a it's inside a, it's in, it's inside, inside a print statement. So expressions are basically that. No matter what, what happens inside the expression, but at the end of the day, it returns something. So yeah, let's look at a, 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 a first example, right? The first thing was functions with no side effects. So if you have a function, like I have a function here, I can actually just give you this other thing, yeah. If you have a function here, we just have a definition of function, 
and then print. So if I run this, and then I call the function. The function itself, when you read in Jupyter Notebook, it, it, it actually has this print statement as a side effect. Reason being, this function does not return this print. It actually returns none. Because we didn't classify the return statement here. So by default, Python is going to return none. Right? So in, in functional programming, you, this doesn't work. We would have to just, I don't know, maybe go take it out and then basically just say return none to be more specific that this thing, at the end of it all, returns none. Which in functional programming doesn't work because why are you even running the expression if you return none? Yeah. Or it might be one of, the, one, one of the use cases that can happen. Uh, this is not return, return. Yeah. Okay, immutability is king. We have a list here with three elements inside. Um, we have A, B, and C as strings. So now, what we would normally do if you wanted to add an element to this list, let's say you wanted to add D, just go list.append and boom, we have an updated list with D inside. But now the problem with this is we actually mutated the initial list, which doesn't work very well with the functional problem. So with functional problem, what we have to do is we we'll take the old list and add it to a new list with, the, with, the just, with, with just this one element inside. And now we have, we have the, the desired outcome without changing the original, um, the original element, if I can put it like that. Right. So this means with functional programming, you're basically using all your, mostly your immutable, immutable objects, like your strings, tuples, uh, frozen sets, those types of things. You can use list and uh, what else is written? The and, and, and not maps. What is it? Dictionaries, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And dictionaries. But just be aware of not meeting, meeting anything. Um, so now here's the problem. If you can't be putting things in, in different lines, for you, especially if you, if you want to write a function, so now what do you do? Because now the, the entire phrase that goes, def, def function name is a statement, it's not an expression. So the, the workhorse under, under functional programming is the lambda function. So we are now going to be looking at the lambda function. So now we have a normal function here, which just basically says add stuff, A and B, and then returns the sum of those two things. The lambda function of this is basically lambda, and then you put your, your arguments here, comma separated, semicolon, and then what you want lambda to return on this side. Um, yeah, the problem with the, with the lambda function, not the problem, one of the, the, nice, the neat things about a lambda function is you can create and call it at the same time. So with this, it's just, with this line, it's basically the, the same lambda function, but we write it and then we call it with these two arguments. This help, this we do a lot, especially when working with blunders. Um, like say maybe, how can I say, like in a, in a dot apply situation where you say df dot apply, then you actually create a lambda function in, inside the dot apply method and it gets created and executed at the same time. And then what if you want an if statement inside your lambda function? Um, so what we basically, what, what, what's basically happening here is we're saying lambda takes in one, one argument, the x, and then x times two, if, x is less than 3, else divide the x by 2. So this is how you put in an if statement inside your lambda function. And also just here, just make it 10 to 12 variable, uh, which there's actually not much need for most, most of the time when you're actually working with uh, functional programming. Because in functional programming, you just, most of the time you just write like this, and it will return whatever it is that you want to return. But if for whatever reason you want to keep it as a, as a variable, yeah, that you could do that. So now we're gonna we're gonna run this this function uh, with the number two and the number four. So now it's basically saying if x is less than three, times it by two. With the first one, the number the x is two, so it's gonna be two times two, you're making it four. And then on the second one, if x is less than three, then divide it by two. So this one is four, but then because it's greater than three, we divide by two, it returns. Uh, I was thinking of calling Muslim languages. I want to say DAO, but it's not a DAO. It's a float. float. Yes. 
And there's actually a way of mimicking the L, the ELIF statement. So with this one, we basically want to return if a number is positive or, or negative, or if it's actually zero. So we say on this lambda function, return cos if x is greater than zero, else return negative x, ah, else return negative, and then there's another if. You can actually chain these things and say they go if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, you can put a lot of them back to back. So if it's not positive, it's, it's also less negative, it's also not, not negative, then it means it's just zero. Positive. Yeah. And then we run it on the, on, on, the, on the first, when we call it the first time, we put in the negative three, it returns negative. Second time around, we put zero, it returns zero. But uh, third time around, it returns positive. So this would actually help out, especially when you're dealing with binders and data frames. You want to apply something to a specific column. Maybe you want to return different values for, or we maybe want to run different calculations or different values for different values that you're going to find inside the data frame. Maybe some you want to just say, okay, if there's nothing, if there's a name, change the name to none. But if there's a number there, change the number to whatever that you want to do. Uh, so yeah, that's not okay. We're not done. You can also put in default values, check, or in a lambda, lambda function. Okay, you can basically pretty much do a lot of things that you can do in a, in a normal function with lambdas. With, with the only trick being everything on a single line. Okay, last one on lambda functions. Because the lambda function is a function in general, you can also nest lambda functions. So basically, a lambda function inside a lambda function. And then <laughs> Before you continue, I just ask yeah. a question. Go back up a bit. Your yeah. default value so yeah. is equal to 2, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say if you haven't specified b. Because in the, in the first one, you only specified 3. So 3 plus 2 will be 5. Mm -hmm. So then, because now you, you, you specified b, it's now 5, no longer b. Oh yeah, yeah. But what, what happens is uh, this default value. The first one I need to put in B, so yeah. this is just A. So it's going to assume that the value of B is two. two okay. But if I do put in any other value, then B is that value. And then uh, what was my lambda doing? Let's check. Okay, my lambda is basically multiplying the number if it's less than three or dividing it by two. So with this lambda. We are basically saying this, it takes in two arguments, it's going to get the first argument and add it to whatever this evaluates to. So I think if you can put another lambda function, and you can actually call the same lambda function so make it recursive. Yeah. So could you do that with the lambda as well? Yeah, you can do it. Um, so I've called yeah. your lambda function in itself. Like when we did those Fibonacci sequences and all that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, it's just that I haven't tested it out, but you, you can do it. Because it's just a function within a function. Okay, what do I want to do now? Okay, so these are, these are the basic provision of lambdas. So you want to ask something? Okay. <laughs> okay, um, another thing. This is, okay, I'm just going to say because it's already here. Uh, this uh, the operator module. Most of the time, when we do, when we are using uh, mostly the arithmetic operations, right? We just use the add, divide, and all those things. But you, it's not really necessarily easy to pass it, uh, to pass the operator as an argument in any of your functions. Uh, you can use them inside your functions, but you can But it's not easy to say a comma b plus inside uh, inside the, where you put in your, all your arguments. So a quick workaround for that is to actually import uh, a package called operator. It's, it's, it's built in onto the standard library. So if you want to use an operator as an argument, you, you can use uh, this package to do it. So here is basically this, I have something called calculator as operator is A and B. So I can, this is basically now A calculator. So I can actually run this by saying, if someone adds operator to add 2, 3, and then returns the results. 
don't know why I put a chair, but there was something in me. <laughs> it's a nice to know. Uh, this should not be here. Okay, comprehension. Okay, first we looked at lambda. Lambda is a built in inside Python. So for functional programming, stay away from doing or building your own functions. You can, the nice thing to do is to use lambda a as much as far, as much as possible. Um, another as much as possible. And another thing that I think I forgot to say this in the beginning. This whatever it is that I'm saying now, it's not it's not I'm not saying that you should when you're doing or running your projects, it's not about just using one way of doing things. Probably. It's actually possible to mix and match. Like there's no problem going um, statements after statements like procedural and throwing a class and throwing something that, that's functional there. So the, the main the main thing about this is just making uh, guys you guys aware that okay there is different styles being used at different times. List comprehensions. Now what a list comprehension is because this what what's happening here you basically staying away from statements. Because with an if statement, you basically go, if this is that, do this. We are, we're basically running away from that first part in functional programming. Okay, so now with the comprehension, for comprehensions can be run, can be run on anything that is an iterable. Uh, so list, it's your list, your tuples, sets, what else is there? If you can iterate over it, you over it, uh, dictionaries. Uh, quick revision, we have a list here, and then for this list, if you wanted to change all the numbers to float, so it's basically whatever it is that you want to do is for, on each element, and then for something, for, for element inside the list, and then it returns a new list with just floats. Same thing with sets, uh, because the list and sets are similar with, with, with sets, having this one function of in, everything inside a set is unique. Yeah, everything is like I said, there are no duplicates inside the set. But you basically treat them in the same you can treat them in the same way as list. Um here, oh yeah, here's the one I, I always forget. Dictionary comprehensions or dict comprehensions. So you can you can you can do a comprehension for dictionaries as well. Normally when you with dictionaries, it's basically key, semicolon, values, for is this right? Wait. <laughs> what was I doing here? In your, oh, okay, okay, okay. So what I'm doing here is basically say enumerating through this list that has one, two, three, four. And then whenever you use enumerate, you're basically just counting. As in first element is zero, one, two, up to the last element. So this creates key value pairs, as in the count of the actual of the actual element and then the element itself. So here it basically is saying key value four value four value key in numerate. I don't know why it's put like this, but it is like this. So when you want to create a dictionary quickly, this is one of the ways of doing it. Um, oh yeah, another thing of using a, a, a dictionary comprehension is you can actually add logic on this part. So here, well, what I'm basically saying is turn all the keys into strings. So because we're doing enumer enumerate, wait a minute, something's not. Does it enumerate start at zero? OK, let's check this. We're checking, we're checking this now. Um, Enumerate. Because I'm looking here, the first key is one. Why is it not zero? Enumerate. Um, say returns. If I have to look through it. Okay, I just want to verify this thing. Because I am so sure that enumerate. Yeah, I started to. Okay, so what did I do here for it to do this? Sorry, let me check something. Yeah, there we go. I made a mistake. It should, it should have been just K 
key value for key value in the point. So now we have 0, 1, 2, up to 4. Right. So let's have a date comprehension. This really, really helps if you have a data frame and you want to take out certain results from that data frame and turn them into like, to a report of some sort. So you basically go in and you look through everything and you just create those key value pairs. And everything comes up as a normal dictionary. Uh, yes? Can I ask something that's a bit more technical? Mm -hmm. So you basically, when you just checked the enumerate, you just did it in like a normal for loop, right? Right. So the list comprehension or the dictionary comprehension is basically, it does the same thing mm -hmm. as the for loop. Why is it so much quicker? If it does exactly the same thing, why does it run so much faster? Like if I'm, I can use a dot mm -hmm. pi with a list comprehension on a data frame and it runs like this. Right. Whereas if I use a dot pi with a for loop on a data frame, I'm missing for hours. <laughs> it's, that whole, uh, it's, it's this thing of, of optimization. Because this has been specifically optimized on the, in the back end, right? You are, I, I'm thinking, okay, that's why most of these functions run faster than your own code. Because your own code is just your own thing. Your own thing is, your code is only Python. Whilst the list comprehension and the list comprehension might be just C code in, in, the, on, in the back end. Mm -hmm. So that's why all of these build sets tend to run faster than our normal, uh, than our normal code. And yeah, we, can, we should actually, I can actually check that out. Um, the thing is, I don't know, I haven't seen the soft code for most of these things, but I am assuming that like a lot of things, especially things that have to do with some calculations, yeah. that's not just Python. <laughs> they actually just go straight to C and then run the, the, the calculation. Okay, this was a dictionary comprehension. Um, okay, here's another application of a dictionary comprehension. So here, what I basically wanted to do is find the length of each string inside the list and then return, return the name of the, return the element as the key and the length as a value. So, you, so we just run this function. So this is, it basically goes key value, right? So the key is going to be the actual item inside the list. And then the value is the length of that item. So this is a basically, yeah, it is, it is a basic, basic for loop, but then it takes everything and returns it as a dictionary. So it's a disk comprehension. And things got jumbled up, because now I have this comprehension if statement. Did I talk about the, the top? OK, I'll fix it later. We didn't do this. Okay, I fixed before I send out the notebook. I'm going to fix this because when these comprehensions, these comprehensions, now we're back to these comprehensions. Uh, but what I wanted to point out here is that all each statements inside this comprehension, when you basically fit them. So with this, it, 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 we have a list of characters. So it returns return a character for a character in L3 if the character is less than D. So A, B, C, and then it gives out everything else. And what's interesting with Python, okay, I think, but I'm assuming all programming languages do this. They know the sequence of characters. So you don't even need to tell which character comes before what they know. Because if you just say, if, if something is less than D, then it goes, okay, sharp. A, B, C, D, then let's see. A, B, C, D. Yeah, A, B, C, sorry. Um, this comprehension with an else clause inside of it. So, I, if I is less than D, else multiply I by 2. Now, the strange thing with this comprehension is the format or the syntax changes. If you have, from when you have a normal if statement, or if you have, a, or, or if you have an if and an else, else clause inside the list comprehension, inside the, the, uh, this comprehension. Here it's just only an if. So it's basically I for I, at least if I is less than D. Okay, no problem. This works for both situations. If you want to put in an S clause, it's here it's saying, it basically said I if I is less than D, else I is equal L, I, or else times I by two. Then you put in your for your for part for something in list. 
I don't know what happened, but it, work, it works this way. And you can also have a nested list comparison. Nested list comparison. Nested list comparison is basically if you could have had a nested for loop, then you can use a uh, nested list comparison. So we have this for loop here, but it basically creates is a, nest, is, is a 2D list, as in a list of lists. So if you run it, there's your list. But the same thing can actually be achieved using a nested. Um, and instead, least comprehension. And nested least comprehension, you basically start from the bottom. So on the on, on the bottom here, so this is the for loop. This is the bottom, and then for i in this is the for loop at the top, and then it runs like that. Okay, so what are we doing here? Okay, we have main list, we have row. So we're basically creating a matrix of some sort. Yeah, it's a matrix. It has three elements, and these three elements have four elements inside of each. Right. So the first thing is we're going to create the we're going to create the first element with the four elements. So we're basically element four element in range four. These are the lists inside the, the, the list, and then four i in range. Uh, in range three for this instance. This also really helps out if you need to create, if you if you need to nest, if you need to need, if you need to nest uh, your anything inside your list comprehension. But once you start doing nesting uh, like uh, up to three nests, then yeah, it gets out of hand. Yes. So the nested lists, you got that in square brackets. If you were to change that into like round brackets, say for a set. Would it then be a list of sets? So that E for E image for if you change the square brackets to round brackets, yeah. you change it from a list to a set. You will have to change. This would be a tuple. Or yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, I would have to change. No. You created a generator. Ah, flip. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't know why it's assuming that I want to create a generator. Okay, let's let's check if the set. Okay, so a set works. Okay, I'd have to look into why it's creating a generator function uh, if you put in the normal braces. Okay, so, but for now, main assumption is if you want a set or if you want <laughs> a list of this, yeah. I'll look into the whole uh, generator function thing later. Uh, right. Oh, here's another, another nifty trick. I just thought I should throw this in here. If you ever need to flatten out a 2D list or a list of lists, this line works. I've had to do this quite a huge number of times. <laughs> like, um, I've done it so much that I actually don't even read it anymore. I just copy and paste it and run it. But it only works on a, on a, on a, on a list of lists, like a 2D array type of thing. So yeah, those was, that was, List, list comprehensions with if and else statements inside of them, and nesting if you wanted to nest. Uh, 1138, okay, I'm gonna speed things up a bit. Right, what if you wanted to do a little addition from two lists using functional programming? Quickest way, you put it, you write your, your everything is normal, like if you visit, like when you're doing a this comprehension, and then you use a built-in called zip. And what zip basically does is it zips. <laughs> yeah. So first element on the first list, first element on the second list, and then it uses them one as a key, one as a value. And then you have to tell it key value for key value in zip, and then the first one is going to be key, second one is going to be the value. And if you run this, you have your dictionary. And the nice thing about using, oh, I think I've mentioned this before, that you can actually run logic on this first part. So we're here basically saying all the keys, make them, make, make them all up cases. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. You can also run these if statements or elif statements inside your, dic your dictionary com or dict comprehension. So basically what we're doing at the top, but if, if the key is not equal to VW. So if it ever comes across a VW, it, it ignores it. 
<laughs> so in this list, as it is, we have the if statement, it returns the Toyota VW and the BM. But if you give it this, this if statement here, and then run it, it ignores VW, because we basically told it, no, don't even think about it. If you see it, then we skip it. Um, yeah, and that's also kind of handy. And then now we're basically going to be looking at built-in functions. Uh, everything I've, talk, I've talked about now is, is mostly about when you when, when you run your own run when you want to run your own logic uh, using lambda or this combination. Because I think most more than half of what you do in functional programming will be around those two things. And now with zip, another nice thing with zip is it's not limited to two lists. You can put in as many lists as you like. Here I have a three lists. The one this one is going to be just a list of characters A, B, and C, and then numbers one, two, three, and then the colors as well. But if you notice, L3 actually has four elements inside of it. And what, uh, what zip does is, it basically works with your shortest list. So, the, with the, so what you're going to end up with is, um, if you're doing a disk comprehension or anything like that, zip is going to say, okay, the shortest, the shortest list is maybe three elements, so I'm only going to return a dictionary that has three elements inside. Or three pairs of key value pairs. Can I say that then? Yeah. So the shortest list determines everything on the There is a workaround um, for this, but then uh, you need to visit the docs for that. <laughs> and then there's uh, enumerates. Okay, we, we, we had a look at the enumerates, and enumerates basically uh, does that. It counts as, as, it, as, it, as it, it's reading uh, all your elements inside an iterable. By default, it counts from zero. But if you want it to come from one, what you basically do, you can inform your logic, just add one onto, onto the count. Because here we're basically saying i plus plus i plus one and then the, the actual element and then starts counting with one. Uh, but I think you now it's there is a functional argument that I can put. Okay, I just want to check this quickly because I know there's a functional argument. It's just that I don't know why I didn't put it there. Oh, oh yeah, and these are all the built-ins. Let me just do this in the meantime. What are we looking for? Numerates. Oh yeah. You can actually start. tell it. Yeah, tell the tell the start. Which means okay. So we give it the editor. Ah. Okay, let me I'll just say this word. We give it a list <laughs> and then we tell it to start counting at one. Otherwise, by default, it counts from zero. Uh, map. Map is, is uh, map is basically if you wanna if you wanna if you wanna run a function with each element inside inside a list, let me just call everything a list. But I'm talking about it, it's a rules. Right? So inside here, if you wanted to multiply everything by two. You go, you put in the function itself, and then you apply a map on it, and then it's going to multiply all the elements inside of it by two. The problem with map is that it returns the map and map object. Reason being, you have to tell it what type of end iterable you want at the end. Because you might be looking for a list, you might be looking for a set, you might be looking for a tuple. So you basically apply everything, but and close it inside of this very creative list. If you change this and you say, set, it returns a set. But most of the time, we're looking for a list. Uh, that's a one, what's it called? A gotcha with, with map. Filter, filter does filtering. <laughs> so we have a list of 10 numbers. From this list, when we basically want to say, why did I run this like this? Oh yeah, we filter, we give it two things. We give it the function and, and 
you give it a function and the list. Same, same thing with man. You give it a function, I want to multiply everything by two, and this is the list that I want to apply this function on. So even with this, you basically say, return everything that's less than five, and you give it this list, which has numbers of zero to nine. Same problem, filter also returns the filter object. So you just basically have to tell it then, when you're done, I want a list of, or I want a list or a set or anything like that. And reduce. Okay, now with reduce, what reduce does is, it returns a rolling computation. First things first is not, you have to import it from fun tools. So let's say we have this list of numbers from one to five, and we want it to run a, a cumulative sum of, for, of all these functions. So what, what reduce does is, okay, sum doesn't show it pretty well. Okay, we're doing a multiplication. What reduce is going to do is it's going to say one times two, get an answer, it's going to be two. And then two times three, six. Six times four, 24. <laughs> Yeah, and then that number actually go that number times five, and then it returns your final output. And then we have an error. That six is not defined. Okay. I didn't run this. Uh, yeah, and then we have all again, okay, then from there we have the logical functions. Uh, and the first one is a list of just ones, which also equates to true. Second one is zeros, which also return equates to false, uh, and then we have sum true, which is one, one, and zero. With this, instead of, uh, if you wanted to check if all, all, your, all, all your elements are true or return true, instead of writing your own function, you can just use a built-in, the, the, the built-in call all. Just wrap your, your, your iterable on all, and then it tells you. Then on the first one, everything is true. On the second one, everything is false. And then because we used all, it wants everything to be true. Because of this zero, this request to a false, and then it says false here. Any, yeah, it's just that if anything is true, it returns true. Uh, which is why it's true for the first and the last, but false for the second one, because everything here is false. If one of these things was true, this one would have to return all true. Yeah. But there is something false here. Uh, this is a nice to know, especially when you're dealing with matrices um, and, and you're not necessarily maybe using pandas. In pandas, it, it, it has a lot of functions to do these this, this computations. But what if sometimes what, the only thing you get is just maybe a list of, of something or an object, and then you have to go find out if anything is true or if anything for, is false. Why do I have this here? Uh, sorry guys, what's happening now is certain things got mixed up. I was actually preparing for two pop-up classes at the same time, so now my stuff is all over the place. Victoria, I'm not doing this today. Okay, nice to know. When doing anything that's, that has to do with uh, functional programming, or did I tell you? Okay, I'm assuming I didn't tell because if I have to think about it. In functional programming, for all functions that you, that you use, if you give them uh, a similar, the same, the same arguments, they always give you the same answers. Like if a function that you give it to a functional object, but it has, it has the has the, 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 the ability to give you different answers or it returns different values, uh, stay away from functional problem. But there's no need for it. Because it assumes that whenever you say, hey, maybe it's an addition function, whenever you give it a one and a two, it will always return three, because there are no side effects. Everything the function does, is all, it will always return the same thing. And the nice thing about that is you can do what's called memoization. I, th I think that's how I'm saying, <laughs> memoization. What memorization is basically is it's, it's a way of getting your, your code to remember the, the, the results of all the functions. So from there, you just basically import fun tools. And then from fun tools, what you want is this cache. So, uh, the, the, so for it's f2, fun tools.lrm cache. It's a way of just basically caching all of your results. 
And what I'm going to do is to showcase that is we have this function, it basically times how long uh, something it takes to run. So we start the timer and then we force it to sleep using seconds and then we return the difference. It basically return how much time that function took. So if we do this, if we run, remember, and we give it two seconds, it's basically gonna, because, I took, because, of, because of the dog sleep, it's gonna wait two seconds, then return the results. But then if I run the same function another next time, it returns the same time. It doesn't even need to think because at the top, it can make the calculation, it knows which results to give out. So yeah, that comes in handy from time to time. Yes? Where does it save that? Like, yeah. th is it, does it take up RAM? So if you were to do something mm -hmm. like that with like massive audio files, for example, <laughs> you just oh, yeah. run out of RAM, RAM instantly if you try and cache all of that data. Uh, my view is if it, if it does, if it's not yet broken, keep pushing. <laughs> so you can try it out and see how far it goes. Because uh, your files might not be as big as you think. Your computer might be actually be able to do all of these things. You can do it and then you get it. And then until you do it, once you start getting a memory error, then you know, okay, maybe, maybe try to back off of it. But your, but, your, but your problem will run fast because of it, because you won't wait for anything. As long as it knows, oh, okay, you had this the first time around, and you just return the results. And then there's some other stuff as well you can use for functional programming under the collections, uh, collections module. Uh, the first one we look at is the, the name tuple. Now with the name tuple, what it does is, for me, it's basically a quick way of creating classes. Yeah. Instead of doing the whole class, dev, needs, all those things, you basically you use a name tuple. What a name tuple does is the first argument is the name of the object. And then the second argument is the, 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 the parameters or the default variables for that object. Here we're just basically creating a class of, of a person. And then for the person, I just gave it to my, myself as uh, your name is equal to the name of that instance. And we're using high tier. I'm assuming I'm 1.7, but I'm not too sure. I need to verify it sometime. <laughs> uh, so now when you when you create this, what it returns is a class with the is a name type because it's a type of object, a name type of the name moves and height. You can actually create as many as you can. Um, let's say we're creating a person, we call this person Vain, give them a name. Give them a name, give them a height, height to say. <laughs> and give it the height. Something went wrong. What happened? Just the height. <laughs> positional argument follows keyword argument. Where is the positional um, argument? You put a comma instead of the height. Oh, snap. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, there was something wrong with the height, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we fixed it now. So <laughs> with that, that, if you want, if you check the type, it basically tells you this thing was created from this object called person, but the actual object is a name type, so it's a quick way of calling of creating objects. Another handy one: order date. An order dictionary. An order date is a normal dictionary has a problem, and, and it has a problem of not being able, you can't index it, you don't know where something is, like with Python can return it either way, right? But with an with order date is, what it does is, it doesn't, it won't necessarily give you back an index, but it remembers the sequence of how things, how, of how things came in, and it will always return those things in, a, in exactly that sequence. So here we created a dictionary of just uh, the car brands and the model, and models for sedans. So and then when we run this, it will always return it like this. But with the normal dictionary, you are not guaranteed that Python is going to remember where everything sits. So this is an order dictionary. Um, flip my way to show you. What would this return in an order date? Any guesses? 
If you go dictionary, you square brackets, you put in a zero. Yeah, that's that is a possibility, but there's a problem. It returns an error, and the reason is to 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 try and index anything. What Python does is basically looks at the first element. So the first on the list, zero is the first element. The, the problem with the dictionary is that if you try to do it like this, it's basically looking for a key at zero. So you can't really do it like this. So you have to have some workarounds. You can do, um, I think you can actually access the first element using a for loop. Okay, let me turn this. Okay, this is an error. So we say, For ID dot items because it's a thingy. If I say print i, it's not going to work out. Or I'd say just print i. If let's see, let me check. Let me check because I've never done this. Where well, I do, but it does this with all the things. Okay, I still need to check that one. Uh, but. I'm pretty sure the other date remembers everything, as in how things came out. Toyota BMW Mac. Yeah, Toyota BMW Mac. For now, it looks simple because there's only three things here. Sometimes you might have 10,000 items inside your dictionary, right? But the other date will keep track of everything as it comes in. Uh, default date. Okay, first problem. In a normal dictionary, if you're looking for a key that doesn't exist, it gives you a key error, as in, that thing doesn't exist. Um, like for instance, if you go here and you go, what do you not say? You don't have a Ferrari. You have a Ferrari, you don't. If I ask you for a Ferrari, <laughs> it doesn't have that very Ferrari there. It doesn't have a more than four Ferrari. So it gives you an error. But an order dictionary, it should be actually here. Okay, I'll fix it later. But a default date basically says, if you are looking for something that I don't have a value for, that value will be created on the spot. And you have to actually tell it what the default value should be. So, so now I'm going to create a dictionary with just names of programmers and their favorite, favorite programming languages. First, I initialize the default dictionary, uh, and then I say this is the return value. Now what happens with default is you have to return a function that returns something. Previous way of doing that is a lambda function. So this is my function, the lambda. Doesn't do any calculations, just returns the string uh, Python. So for any programmer that we try to ask the dictionary for, if you cannot find them, it's going to just associate them, them with Python. So we run this, we run this one. At the moment, it's basically two, two different things. This line creates the default dictionary. This line is an actual dictionary. So we need to update. We need to update the digital default dictionary with this one called programmers. Now this it doesn't we don't we don't have to do it like this. You can actually create a dictionary inside the update method, or you can basically populate it in another normal ways of programming. And then when we look for do do large JavaScript, okay, he's here. We look for another name, we're looking for Rian, there's no Rian on the actual thing, on the actual lab. Uh, Dictionary, so if you run it, it doesn't give you a key error. It just looks for it. If it doesn't find that value, it just reverts back to your default value. Yes? And if you print the default deck now, will we be only in there? So does it actually update? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's the other. And, that, and another thing is, nothing stops you from actually also do it the normal way. Um, as in programming language revolution A. Revolution A's favorite thing is Dex. Right, and it works. And then if you print it again, Shane should be somewhere. Sorry, Shane. <laughs> Sorry. It's like this. Uh, okay, Shane is there with, with Dex. No, this is Oh, yeah, because I changed because the keys are different. Everybody loves the X. <laughs> yeah. So. But yeah. it doesn't actually touch the initial dictionary, the programmer's dictionary is untouched. 
Yeah, that one must differ because we're only working on the default state. So that's basically how thingy works, like when you want to create a new column in the not frame. Yeah, mm -hmm. you should just do that. Oh yeah, because yeah. you can't find it to just create it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, guys, uh, that was a, a brief rundown of functional programming. There is a lot of ways of, of doing this. But basically, uh, it focuses on all the built-in methods. Where are these things? There you go. Focuses heavily on using the, the built-in functions because these functions have, have been optimized in the back end. Um, one-line statements, or not one-line statements, one-line expressions or one-line functions. And yeah, you don't necessarily have to use it by itself. Use it in combination with all the different types of programming that you, that, that you already know to achieve whatever results that you want to achieve. And that is it for today. Thank you so much. Oh, Flip, I was over five minutes. <laughs>